Okay. Um, yeah. So we're uh, we're here today to have uh, with uh, three of us or four of us that are going to talk about what's going on in uh, research software and the progress that we've been making and in including it within the scholarly ecosystem. Uh, so I'm Dan Katz from University of Illinois. Um, I'll let everybody else introduce themselves when when they come up. Um, but just briefly, we have uh, Moran, Christina, and Daniel that will also be speaking. Um, and specifically, uh, this will be about um, software and related metadata, software and publications, and software and registries and repositories. And our hope is that this takes about uh, 35 minutes to go through items one through four, and then we have about 15 minutes left for questions and discussion at the end. Um, so in general, we're gonna try to hold questions until the end, unless there's anything truly really urgent. Okay, so just to start off with then, um, oh, first I just want to try to make the case for the importance of research software. Um, these slides are all on Zenodo, so you can grab them from the link on the bottom. Um, if somebody else wants to put that in chat, they could, but if not, you can, anybody can copy and paste it. Shouldn't be too bad, uh, sorry, uh, uh, manually copy and paste it because you can't copy out of screen share. Um, but, but we have studies that show that over 90% of researchers use research software in their work. Uh, more than 50% develop software as part of their research, and also that about 50% of research grants produce software. So, um, so we believe that these really demonstrate that software is, a, is an essential part of research for, for most people today, uh, either developing it or at least using it. Um, software is as important to a paper or a data set, or sorry, as important as a paper or a data set for full understanding and dissemination of research. And for that reason, it has to be properly entered into the scholarly record for people to really know what happened and be able to reproduce it ideally. And uh, if we are able to successfully find and access software that helps further research, and it provides a means for other researchers to then um, to use that software, uh, and that could be to support attribution and, and credit uh, in terms of um, things that are similar to how we do papers and data and other things, it could be enabling peer review and validation and reproducibility of findings. Uh, it could better support collaboration and reuse. And it, of course, encourages building on the work of others, which we all, I think, want to do. So there's been, um, I'll, I'll just talk about three different things really quickly. Uh, one is uh, work that's happened in research software citation. In Force 11, we had two working groups, uh, one on software citation directly, uh, that developed a set of software citation principles from 2015 to 2016. And then one that basically took the next six years and made progress in then actually implementing those principles, developing best practices. Uh, and what that group did was to develop um, initially a set of challenges that needed to be addressed, a set of checklists for paper authors and software developers that want to cite software or make their software citable, uh, respectively, a set of best practices for software repositories and registries, and then uh, a bunch of guidance for journals. And I think we've gotten to the point today where citing software is developing as a common practice, um, but it is not a, uh, by any means, a universal practice. And journals and editors still need themselves to have consistent guidance and to provide that guidance to their authors in a way that actually matches the styles of their publications. Um, we also have done a bunch of work on FAIR for research software. Uh, starting in 2021, we uh, convened a group as a, uh, a joint group between uh, RDA, uh, Force 11, and research, RISA, the Research Software Alliance. And we had a uh, pretty community intensive iterative process over 11, uh, 18 months that developed uh, the FAIR principles for research software. Uh, and we wrote a, a short paper about this as well. And the main thing to say here is that the FAIR principles for research software are um, basically revise and extend the original FAIR principles, which sometimes I call the FAIR data principles because data is, is so strongly implied in them, even though that wasn't part of the name. And the reason that we needed to do this is because of inherent differences between research software and research data. Um, and, and in some sense that boils down to the fact that software can be stored as data, but it isn't just data. And if you just think of it as data, you lose a lot of the, the essential parts and the essential characteristics of the software. Uh, and then the last thing I think to mention is that there are a lot of challenges that remain. Um, we've had a lot of people working in this area over so, roughly 10 years. Um, 
but, uh, but this is actually a pretty hard problem. And there are technical and social challenges or technical and social aspects to these challenges. And in, in my opinion, at least, these are particularly related to metadata, archiving, and versions, um, all of which are somewhat different for software than they are for papers or for data. And so just as, in, as some examples, um, when you think about data that is being published, it typically is created, and then it's published, and then the publisher makes it accessible. Um, but software is always, uh, at least open source software, is always accessible even before it has formally been published and it has a, uh, something like a DOI in some cases or, or some other identifiers. We can, we'll, we'll, I think Moran will talk more about some of this. Um, there's questions about where the software metadata should be stored. Uh, should it be stored with the code directly? Uh, what if the code is closed source? Where would it go? Should it go in an archival repository? Should it go in a registry? Um, where should software actually be archived for the long term? Uh, a lot of software is on GitHub or GitLab, but these aren't archival and people can delete the, the repositories on there as easily as they want. Uh, registries aren't archival. Uh, there are data repositories, things like Zenodo that, that are. Uh, and then software heritage is another uh, potential answer here. Um, and then there's also the case of versions that different use cases about research software need a specific version, the latest version, all versions, the latest major version. There, there's a lot of different options here. Uh, one of the other challenges then more on, kind of more on the social side is actually getting what we think are best practices actually into practice so that people will actually do them. Um, and then there's also a lot of work that's needed beyond these things that I've talked about of citation and fair. Um, so you can have software that's cited and software that's fair, that's low quality, that's incorrect, that's not reproducible, that's not open, and that's not community supported. And if we want to move to a world where all those things are properties of the software, then there's something else that we're missing so far beyond citation. Okay, so that's the, the quick version of what I wanted to just talk about to introduce things. I'm going to turn this now over to Moran to talk about software and metadata, and I'll ask Moran just briefly to introduce herself as well. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for the introduction here, uh, which is uh, perfect for software heritage. Well, I will introduce myself first. Uh, my name is Moran Greenpeter. Um, I work at Software Heritage in the INRIA Research Center in Paris. I am head of uh, Open Science Operations, and I'm also the connection here to uh, the European project that we participate in and connecting the scholarly ecosystem to software heritage. For those of you who do not know software heritage, it is the Universal Source Code Archive trying to um, collect, preserve, and share all software source code publicly available, similarly to the uh, what is done by archive.org for the web, but we do it for, for software. And I'm going to ask you, Dan, to move to the next slide, slide please. And well, today I'm going to talk about metadata. Um, as you seen on the last slide, uh, a little bit uh, of metadata across the world. Before doing so, I want to clarify the magic because when you think about software, you usually think about the magic behind things. And we need to know what are we talking about? What are we trying to describe? And what are we trying to archive? And there's the software, well, the concept of the software, the project, the community, the entity, maybe the idea of what this software is trying to do, which is not a digital artifact. With that, you might have a collection of digital artifacts that is a very, very large one with executables, source code uh, artifacts for multiple environments. And we want to see what we can do about that. Next slide, Dan. Sorry. Yes, no worries, no worries. Too fast. This is, you have a, yeah, there's a, yeah, that's the one. Well, yes, that's the one. Well, now separating executable and, and source code, why do we want to archive the source code? Well, because the knowledge is in the source code and we want to keep this knowledge. Now, it is very hard to um, to think about reuse and um, reproducibility when thinking about executables. Now, these two um, um, citations here, source code provides a view into the mind of the designers are very important to keep in mind when thinking about keeping the knowledge for future generations. Next slide, then. 
software is not just data. It evolves over time. We need to keep that in mind. And the research software is just a thin layer on top of a global software stack because most software isn't developed in academia. So we need to keep in mind that when we do want to talk about software, it's not about just research software. It's also about the full software stack. Next slide. Now, software is a pillar of open science, and it has multiple facets in academia. It can be a tool, it can be the research outcome or result, or an object of research. I haven't put here the definition of research software, but software is used for all of these facets and should be um, described and archived alongside articles in open access repositories and data in open datasets repositories. Next slide, Dan. As Dan said, it is used across all disciplines. And here it is a um, view of the barometer in, uh, in France showing the proportion of publication in France that mentioned code or software. And you can see that that's a lot. Um, and you have a very large proportion of the publications that are referencing and citing software in some way, which is not, maybe not the best way that we can think about. Next slide. What is at stake? We need to archive the software source code to make sure we can access and retrieve the software. We need to reference it to make sure we can identify the software artifacts, not just the software as a whole or the project. We need to describe it. So this is the, the key item that I'm, I want to uh, stress out in this presentation about the metadata because with this description, it is easier to discover the software project and the software artifacts that are used. And finally, we want to cite software. So this is in this workflow with public publishers because researchers want credit. And we want to make it rewarding to create software by giving credit to the authors. Next slide. Now, where is the metadata available? We can find metadata a little bit everywhere. And I would say that the best place to put the metadata or one of the important places to put the metadata is in the source code itself. So you can find extrinsic metadata, oh, which is nice. external to the source code on different <laughs> platforms, on the software development platforms, on catalogs and registries, on scholarly repositories, in package managers, In this can come also in the files themselves, in the source code files, and on scholar, in scholarly publishers' platforms. Now, if you look at source code, you can see that there are already practices to put metadata in the code. There are readme files for descriptions, license files to describe which license has been used, authors' files, and there's the package manager files that I already mentioned. We, I want to share some things with you about other types of files like the code method or JSON file or the citation CFF file, which can be better for much machine actionability. Next slide, Dan. Now, when I say code method or JSON, I might not talk to uh, a lot here that may, maybe you don't know code meta. And so, so you know what is code meta? Well, code meta is a subset of schema.org. It's an academic community and there is something very precious in this community, which is called the crosswalk table, which is a set of mappings between code meta, the code meta vocabulary, and different vocabularies or ontologies that just want to describe software. And what's important about that is we, we are using those mappings at Software Heritage to translate metadata from different uh, vocabularies into code meta. Now, in 2023, there was a new governance model that was put in place. The version three of the code meta voc vocabulary was released. A new open identifier was added to it. And we have, so that wasn't in 2023, but improvements to the code meta generator, which is a um, form-based manner to create a code meta Dungeon file uh, is also accessible. And the next step for code, the code meta code community is to improve the code meta mapping so that these mappings will become also machine action. Next slide, please. Just before then, yes, it is important to keep the humans in the loop because not everything can be automatic. And I'm going to share with you very briefly, this uh, moderation process that we have with HAL, even though 
I didn't share yet the, well, I won't share it in this presentation, but you can find um, information about it online. There is a connection between scholarly repository and software heritage. One, pr the prototype connection was done with the HAL French National Archive, where um, researchers submit their software on the, um, on the archive and it is then transferred to software heritage. Before being transferred to software heritage, there is a moderation process where humans, uh, archivists, are checking the curation quality. They are checking if the credit is due to the right people and uh, checking the compatibility between the record, the metadata record that is going to be on the HAL platform and the code itself that is being submitted. And in this um, uh, process, it is important to, to note that we need to have the information in the code so that moderation can be done. And here the credit is at stake and automation will be difficult to put in place. And so we have uh, we have got to keep humans when we are dealing with this type of uh, of work. Now, just to share quickly, this is the citation format provided on the HAL platform. We have the same processes also with publishers, with IPOL and with eLife, and we are working towards other uh, journals to join the same uh, connection with software heritage and uh, metadata. Um, metadata records on their platforms. Next slide then. And last, last slide for metadata and the road ahead for metadata and software. We have released um, a, also in 2023, the research software metadata guidelines. And we are having now an open call by the EU project Fair Impact to implement the guidelines. So please, if you are eligible for this open call, you can come and check out um, uh, the deadline is April 5th. Uh, we have the community discussing code meta issues. R recently, there's a very interesting is issue about documentation. Um, and there are new things coming ahead. Uh, you can come and watch information about that at the next RDA plenary 2022 uh, on software source in the software source code session. And just a link to the save, uh, save code now feature on Software Heritage, which is our Wayback Machine, where you can save any code. And finally, a link to the code meta generator directly if you want to try out and uh, create um, metadata, metadata files and insert it in the uh, code repository and make sure that this um, code is indexed in Software Heritage. Thank you. If you have any questions after this session, I'm available online in my email and I will pass the hand. Thank you, Dan, for sharing the slides. You can, yes, thank you. Okay, yeah, th thanks very much, Maren. Uh, again, we'll do questions at the end of the, uh, the presentation. So, so two more to go. Uh, one uh, next on software and publishing from Christina. And uh, Christina, please go ahead and introduce yourself as you're starting. Thanks, Dan. Could you go to the next slide? Sorry, I'm having, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, so thanks, Dan. Thanks to organizers. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm going to talk a little bit um, about a publisher perspective on sharing research software, um, and specifically strategies that we share for our authors and our editors and how we implement it in our journal. So I'm Christina Braunbelder. Uh, I work at the American Geophysical Union uh, alongside a much bigger team. You can find uh, me at this email here. Uh, next slide. And the American Geophysical Union, if you're not familiar with us, we are a nonprofit scientific society in the Earth and Space Sciences. We publish 24 journals. We have 60,000 members internationally. Um, and the open science team at AGU is bigger than me. It includes Shelley Stahl, our VP of Open Science Leadership, who is in this call today, um, Brian Sidora, Sophie Hansen, and a number of members of our publications team also support. Uh, next slide, please. And open science at AGU is also bigger than the, just open data and open software, even though that's uh, where my expertise is in, is in and where I'll be talking um, today. Uh, but it's a, it's a holistic effort that we implement across AGU, uh, across multiple uh, different areas of DEI, uh, community science, inclusion and equity, uh, as well as open access, open books and open preprints. Next slide, please. Um, that being said, what I'm going to talk about today is a little bit about our approach to sharing software in AGU journals. 
Our history with open data and software at AGU goes back uh, a number of years. We've been involved in a wider project across publishers in Earth and Space Sciences, the Coalition on Publishing Data in Earth and Space Sciences. Um, and for a number of years now, we've had data and software sharing guidance for authors submitting to AGU journals. In 2022, we implemented a lot of staff support for formatting data citation and software citation correctly, uh, known as our data citation pilot. And all of our journals are now entered in that data citation pilot. Incentives are also really important. We're asking our researchers to change the way they practice science when we ask them to share their data and share their software. It's important to us that um, software creators, uh, data creators uh, are recognized for their efforts. Uh, so we launched an open science recognition prize at AGU last year. Uh, and uh, you can go look up the current awardees and we hope that this continues. Uh, it's an important element of, of uh, sharing software and sharing data. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so this is a, a little bit about our policy for data and software citation at AGU. We implemented this policy because we want to make sure that uh, the research shared in AGU journals is of the utmost reproducibility and transparency, uh, that we elevate data and software outputs as equally important research outputs as the peer-reviewed article from research, and that we make sure that creators of data and software are having that ability to get credit for their work that authors who reuse data or who re reuse software are creating that linkage, that citation back to the original data set or software that will enable credit, provenance, attribution, all these great things. Our policy asks authors to deposit data and software in a community accepted and trusted repository, preferably with a DOI. So as Moran mentioned, uh, we, want we want that trackability and uh, GitHub is not a permanent solution for sharing software. We then ask authors to include an availability statement, uh, where and how to access the data and software. This is the human readable element of our guidance. This allows the reader of the paper to immediately see at the end of each paper, uh, where is the data, what is the data, where is the software, what is the software. Finally, we ask that authors include a citation to data or software in the references section. This is where the author uh, creates that uh, automated linkage between data sets, between softwares, and between publications that will ultimately enable a system, an infrastructure system that allows data set creators and software creators to get credit for their work, for reuse of their work. And this graph shows a little bit about the implementation of the data set, the data citation pilot over time. So again, this is um, a pilot that AG Publications has driven that provides staff support to each and every author of papers that are published with AGU to make sure that they're correctly sharing their data and software and getting that citation correct in the references section. For many authors, sharing their data and software and citing it in a journal article is a new concept. They're used to citing other journal articles, but they're not used to citing data sets, software. Uh, but, and so we're giving them the support to make sure that they understand how to correctly implement our guidance. Since the pilot began in 2022, we've seen a huge uptake in authors who are mentioning things about data and software, who are sharing data and software alongside their research articles, who are describing data and software in that availability statement, all the elements that we're looking for of reproducibility and transparency being enhanced in our articles, and also creating those linkages um, through citations to data sets and software. Uh, next slide, please. So what does successful citation look like? This is something we talk a lot about to our editors, to our authors, and to researchers more generally. Um, successful citation uh, transparency and reproducibility enabled by sharing of data and software is kind of a, a spectrum. Uh, it starts with uh, the article containing the data and code and the SI. This is what many authors are used to. They think, oh, I'll share my data alongside my article um, in maybe a PDF that's associated with that article. We are asking them to move several steps down the spectrum, uh, not just uh, sharing that data in the SI, but actually sharing it in the repository, which requires uh, coordination between publishers and repositories. We're asking them to then cite that data, that code in the references section of the DOI. If they get that far, that's really great. They've already created a, a data output, a software output, and a paper output and linked all of them with a citation. And then if they're reusing data, if they're reusing software, we want to create this and instill this idea in them that they should be citing that data and citing that other person's software the same way that they would cite someone's research article uh, from a few years ago that they um, read and sort of that made an intellectual contribution to their work. Uh, and uh, next uh, slide, please. Uh, this is really, really important to us because this is what enables this culture of reproducibility and transparency and credit and attribution. A data set or software citation in the references section in an HU journal should look something like these two examples. 
You'll see they're very similar to journal article citations. Um, they've got a field for creators or authors. Uh, they've got a publication date. They've got a title. Importantly, a few different elements. They've also got a version for data or software. Um, if a version exists, it should be included in the citation. And they've got a bracketed description flag uh, that tells the reader whether or not it's a data set or a software. This is important not just for the reader, but also for journal publishing infrastructure uh, to make sure that data set and software citations uh, correctly enter uh, our infrastructure system and, our and accompany the paper metadata. And if you would like to read more about journal production guidance for software and data citations, uh, Shelley's got a paper out uh, and the DOI is below and it creates uh, it's created a very detailed set of recommendations for publishers on how to successfully implement data set and software citations. Next slide, please. This is a little bit about um, the difference between data set and software citations that we've seen in AGU journals since releasing our, our policy the number of years ago uh, from 2019 to last year. Uh, the percentage here gives uh, when you're looking cross reference metadata for AGU articles. Uh, what percentage can you identify as software citations using that bracket and description flag versus data citations? Uh, since the, we released our policy, the number of software citations associated with AGU articles has been lower than the number of data citations. And even as the proportion associated with papers has increased, uh, that sort of ratio has stayed very similar. Uh, authors are more likely to share the data uh, than they are to share software. Of course, there are a number of reasons why this might be true, including um, that not uh, all authors understand what is software, what is code, and what is shareable. A lot of authors come to us with questions about proprietary software that they've used to analyze their data. Uh, they might not understand the difference between software and code. We're constantly working on our guidance for authors to make these distinctions more clear to them and to help them understand how to better share their work. Next slide, please. Uh, alongside that guidance that we have in that green box, that bottom left box uh, for data and software citation in our journals, we also have a number of resources like workshops, presentations, um, other guidelines in our Zenodo community that help authors better understand not just how to cite their data and software, but how to share their work in a more reproducible and open way, thinking about data documentation, software documentation, um, and how to work more openly. Uh, we teach a free course called the Introduction to Open Science, primarily for early career researchers, and the course materials are openly um, available. We're teaching it right now. And we cover the idea of how, as an early career researcher, do you get started sharing your work? And how do you ultimately share your data and software alongside your publication? We have a number of resources like postcards and things that we hand out at meetings. We help support open science and data help desks. And we always get questions from authors about sharing their software. And not just how do they cite it in an EG journal, but how did they get to that step to begin with? They don't always understand all the connections that you make between starting scripting in MATLAB or starting scripting in Python all the way through towards working in a collaborative environment like GitHub, and then ultimately sharing your work with a DOI alongside your paper. Um, this kind of capacity building is super important for uh, research software as well as for data. Next slide, please. There are a number of other barriers to data and software sharing uh, in citation that we're exploring. Um, this is one of them that I've been working on with Natalie Rea, who's a postdoc at the University of Arizona. Uh, authors commonly use reference managers to format all the citations for their journal articles. They might have 100 citations for each journal article. It's not uh, wieldy to manage those by hand. However, reference managers are really uh, unequipped right now to handle correct citations for data sets and software. Uh, they commonly miss fields. They commonly uh, uh, mess up the citation in a way that makes it not readable by a human or by a machine. This is something that we're working because we need to help authors overcome these barriers, make it easier for them to share their work more openly, not more difficult. Next slide, please. So I've given you a little bit of an overview about open science at AGU, about the resources that we have available for, soft, for um, authors to help encourage data and software citation. We have ongoing co conversations about the next challenges. Uh, obviously capacity building and education and resources are still needed to help better the practice of citation of data and software, not just for researchers, editors, peer reviewers, but also for publishing staff, for infrastructure providers, and for repositories. Uh, it's, also a, it's also a journey. It's not um, that we've achieved openness and fairness in a single step. Uh, reproducibility is a topic that comes up a lot in conversation for editors. Just sharing your software, as Moran point, pointed out, it does not necessarily make it reproducible. Uh, we'd like to encourage the practice of reproducibility, but we're starting where we can. And then finally, we're asking authors, we're asking publishing staff, we're asking all members of the community to take on more effort to make their work better. And ultimately, open science uh, will better the practice of science. But in the meantime, as we achieve that culture change, 
we need to make sure that we're providing incentives for open science, that we're recognizing the efforts that are being put in by researchers to achieve sharing of data and sharing of software and help them along their journey. Uh, so thanks everyone. I'm looking forward to questions at the end. Great, thank, thank you very much, Christina. Uh, and then uh, the last of the, of the short talks is gonna be Daniel. Uh, so Daniel, again, please, uh, please go ahead and introduce yourself as you start. All right, thank you very much, Stan. Uh, my name is Daniel Garijo, and I'm from Universidad Politecnica of Madrid. I'm a, a researcher here at the university, but I've worked uh, for many years in knowledge representation, metadata representation specifically, uh, that where it has to do with research software, right? So, uh, next slide, please. So today I'm here as a co-chair of the Consortium for Scientific Software Registries and Repositories which, as the name indicates, is a consortium of uh, institutions, well, organizations that represents either a software registry or, or a repository in uh, different domains. So far, I think we have up to 37 different resources. We are calling resources as a software registry or repository. But if you are, <clears throat> also have experience on sharing and editing best practices for software, you are more than welcome to join us as well, right? Uh, the idea is that this is a forum to discuss the best practices a little bit more um, uh, on the resource side, that is, uh, people who hold an infrastructure, right, and want to make sure that some of these best practices are shared. But we are also promoting and trying to uh, get involved in the maintenance, for example, in software metadata uh, vocabularies such as code meta, as Moran introduced before. Uh, in fact, we, we, we have a collaborative task with CodeMeta. We, we talk to Moran as much as we can. And we also have monthly meetings and presentations where one month eh, eh, every one of us uh, will present either one infrastructure that is associated with the role of the consortium or uh, also um, an initiative that can help the people uh, participating in the call understanding better how to adopt best practices and so on, right? Next slide, please. So a little bit of history. Um, uh, I wanted to uh, give credit where the credit's due. And uh, here in the slide, you'll see uh, Tom and Alice Allen and Thomas Morel who, uh, and Mike Hooker, who are one of the, uh, well, the, the people, the, the forces uh, behind the group, because they started everything organizing a workshop, I think a couple of years ago, 2020, they can remember 2020 something maybe, or 2019, where um, people representing several infrastructures, I think up to 14 different infrastructures, got together in order to talk about the best practices for the resources and also uh, talk about the code meta adoption on and the uh, CFF standard adoption. Next slide, please. So. Initially, we were for like 14 for uh, people from 14 different resources, and this was a little bit the distribution on whether they are from different communities, which is mostly well half of them from uh, from different communities. Whether the the resources were accepting only software or not, because there are some um, some resources that start looking or, or that have to do with data because people seem to be more cons considering that as more important uh, in the beginning, but then later they, they acknowledge the importance of software as well and other uh, attributes of the different infrastructures, such as whether uh, it's a registry of our, or a repository, being that a repository sh uh, stores the deposits while the registry only stores the metadata of the software or resource or artifact that is being minted, then uh, whether the resource can mean DOIs, which are the digital object identifiers commonly used to identify different uh, software components, and whether, for example, there is manual curation, which in this case most of the people participating there were, uh, were represented resources with active curation because they were from domain-specific communities. Next slide, please. So this is more a little bit uh, the timeline that, uh, that uh, we have been having so far. Uh, Everything started, as Dan commented out, with the software citation uh, interest group from uh, the Force 11 task force. And uh, from this uh, spawned the workshop led by Alice, Tom, and Mike. 
And uh, after this workshop, basically, this led to a series of best practices that we published in archive and later in the PRJ journal, and then the inception of the Psychodes Consortium as a separate group where we discuss all the problems and, and best practices and adoption of best practices for scientific registries and repositories. Next slide, please. In a nutshell, I didn't want to end up my talk without uh, telling you what the best practices are because it took quite a bit of discussion. And well, it's, uh, when you look at them, um, they make a lot of sense, but it, it looks like a little weird that these were not uh, uh, written before. So we start with something like uh, in whenever you're creating a new resource or infrastructure, make sure to provide a public statement of, of what is the scope of the resources that you are accepting, specifically for software. Make sure that you provide guidance both for users who need to uh, use the things, uh, the metadata that is in your resource, but also for the software contributors, that is how to contribute to a new entry in your resource. Make sure that you have a clear authorship policy because sometimes um, even people that are not an author of our software may be able to register that software in a resource from other people and then what happens to that entry? Uh, would our authors be able to maybe, I don't know, later claim authorship over that resource and edit metadata if it needs maintenance or what, what is it going to happen, right? Also, one that is very close to my heart is trying to document and share your metadata schema. Sometimes all these registries are, they think about how to show the fancy pages, but uh, when you want to mine them a little bit and get interesting metadata, the metadata schema sometimes is not clear and, and it should, right? And then others like stipulating the conditions of use, privacy policy, specifically if you are keeping author data in your system, and also um, uh, what happens with the retention policy, for example, if you have software records that uh, are become outdated, will they, uh, is there a retention policy for them to be there uh, before changing, or if someone wants to retract a software component, what would happen to, to that, whether that's possible or not. And finally, disclose the end of life policy, which is something, I mean, everyone is eager to start new infrastructures, but it's not so, so clear what happens after one of these infrastructures goes away. What happens with the metadata and metadata records? Is there a plan to move uh, all this information and to store it somewhere if a, a funding runs out, right? So thinking about this is also very important to build the trust from the different communities in your resource. And well, if if you uh, want to contribute to this discussion, please join us. I mean, that there is no membership fee or anything like that. You can just join us in our monthly meetings, and uh, every month we have a different uh, presentation. So you're welcome, welcome to join the discussion. And then uh, one exercise that we did as well was try to uh, see how many uh, how many resources, which of the or of our own resources follow the best practices. And uh, you can see that even from our own resources, we do not uh, currently follow the best practices perfectly by heart, right? So the authorship policy and some are missing the metadata schema, some are missing some are missing our retention policy, but still with this effort we are working towards now uh, making sure that everyone has additional examples that they can incorporate into their own resources. Next slide, please. As I call this evolving, as I said before, we started with 14, but we are past 30 right now. And this is a little bit of the distribution that we of the resources that we have now. Uh, so, um, as I said before, you are welcome to join us. And I think that's uh, pretty much it. So, next slide, please. Oh, and finally, before I, this is my last slide, before I uh, move on, we, before we moved on to the uh, questions, I wanted to also point to this as a scholarly infrastructures for research software report, which was published, I think, uh, a couple of years ago, and the follow up a gap analysis report that has been done by the European Open Science Cloud uh, Working Group, um, where basically we take uh, into account all these uh, all these needs that need to be had by different infrastructures for research software and do a gap analysis. So we are all currently taking this as part of PsyCodes and trying to analyze whether to see whether we can uh, 
contribute to address some of these gaps identified uh, there. So I think this is very relevant and I invite you to have a look as well. And that's it, thank you very much. Okay, thank you as well. Um, and also we'll move into uh, just general discussion at this point. I'm gonna stop sharing so we can see everybody. Um, and I see uh, there's a Q&A feature and somebody, Jessica has asked a question. I don't know, Jessica, do you want, if you wanted to unmute and ask your question, you could, and if not, I can just try to read it. But. Okay, well, I'll just go ahead. So the question is, uh, do you have any recommendations for interfacing with journal editors who insist that software citations have a list of authors rather than a developer team authorship? Um, maybe Christina might have some opinion, uh, basically kind of related to group authorship and how that's allowed versus individual authorship. And, and at least in some cases, group authorship also can have uh, pseudonyms or GitHub usernames as opposed to real people's names. Um, that's a good question. I would probably point them to some of the existing resources out there that exist around software citation and data citation. Um, for instance, I think there's a Earth Science Information Professionals report released on best practices here. Um, and you know, for many uh, for many preserved uh, software repositories of the DOIs, uh, the metadata schema already set up to handle you know creators versus contributors in that sort of sense. Um, and I would point them to that established practice as well. But I don't have any um, hands-on practice from working with AGU editors on this. That was before my time at AGU. Maybe Shelley has something to weigh in on this discussion. I'm not sure. It's really, it's really a culture change. Um, I, there's, there's not yet a full understanding um, from journal uh, staff that the contributors to a particular software package evolve over time and have to be tracked in a different way. Um, there's legacy needs to have uh, responsibility for that particular preserved item. Um, think of an article, you, you have a, a responsibility to have all of the authors properly identified. Um, so it's, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's evolving. Um, and having groups like Sci codes and the Force 11 team weigh in on these recommendations is really important. So um, I don't think a journal should have the right answer. I think the software community should have the right answer, so. Great, Th thanks to both of you. I'll just mention, I put a, a note in chat about a paper that I was a co-author on that came out uh, just a, a few, couple of weeks ago that's talking about some of the issues related to this. Um, let's see, I see uh, Castedo and Daniel. I, Daniel, did you actually want to comment on this specifically or did you want to comment on something else? Yeah, on this specifically, that I uh, just wanted to say that, uh, well, we also have like the credit system where different, uh, that for papers, no, you have like, oh, well, this person worked on the grant, this person worked on, I don't know, section X or doing the experiments and so on. So I don't see why we, uh, would not be able to say, well, this is the team that worked on the uh, software implementation associated with this software, if you want to say the software itself or uh, or the software implementation associated with the paper. Okay, uh, so I'll, um, I'll just point out that in the, in the ESIP group, uh, the Earth System, Earth System Information Partners or Science Information Partners, sorry, I don't remember what the S is, um, there's been a, a, a working group that's been looking at this for a couple of years and um, and the, the quick version is that there's a few different ways of capturing um, contributions and credit is the one that is the most coarse, the least fine in some sense. And it's the one that probably does the worst job of capturing different software roles. Um, so I, I agree with you in principle. I'm not sure if credit is exactly the answer, but it's a, it's a, doing something in that direction sounds like a great idea, I think. Um, Okay, let's go on to uh, Castedo. I don't know if you had a comment on this or a different question. Yes, uh, I guess I had a, a question. Um, I, it's really to if anyone in the panel or if I, I guess maybe more a little bit more to Moran's um, talk, but I, what I'm curious about is with software documentation, I feel like I, I've seen like all kinds of different vent, uh, channels for software do documentation in the research setting, including supplemental material of a journal article. Sometimes it's just a web page that isn't even really archived. 
it generally will be kind of embedded or sometimes embedded in the software itself, but not really in a readable form. It might be just, you know, the source that generates, say, a web page that's for documentation. And then, of course, there are journal papers that are not traditional papers. They're really papers talking about the software and what it does. And uh, so my question is kind of what what people think is kind of the what should be done in the future and where where should software documentation live in this? Should it, should it just stay within the digital repository kind of? Or should it be in a in some kind of new kind of journal article, or should it be a preprint? It seems like there are a lot of different directions it could go in. Yes, I can take the question if you want. Um, well, thank you. That's a very large discussion, uh, which I won't resolve in a few minutes in a in a answer here. Um, because there are many options. An option of having the documentation with the software is better for archival, but might not be better for uh, usage. Um, my personal recommendation is to link it in some way in a metadata, um, in a metadata file. Uh, the problem actually at the moment is that we are currently in CodeMeta discussing, the CodeMeta community discussing how you should um, document the documentation. Well, uh, how you should give this property in a metadata file. So we would love to have you join or anyone here interested in this discussion on the uh, code meta issues where we are currently discussing that. So thank you for bringing that up. Maybe someone else has other uh, ideas in on, on this particular uh, question. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, maybe. I mean, maybe I'll just say that it's. Uh, I think it's an open question, and I'll, I'll agree with Moran that I, I think it's it's something where we need more discussion, and I don't think there's going to be any one answer at this point. Okay, let's. Um, so I'll just uh, mention there's two more questions that have come into the Q and A. Uh, so Sarah, if if you want to say your question, that would be fine. If not, I can read it again. Um, sorry, Dan. Um, before that, there was another question that I accidentally marked as answered. Uh, from Rebecca. <laughs> uh, I see. Yes. Okay. Um, so, right. So from Rebecca, what is the opinion of this group on whether a software search interface should host only the metadata or also a copy of the software for permanent archival? Uh, right. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, whoever would like to answer that one? I can go <laughs> if you want, because it's about archival. Um, so, um, Yes, you can. It depends on how you you uh, what's the policy of your institution or your platform. But if you are reposing on the uh, premise that you have a universal source code archive, a software heritage, and you reference the code in software heritage, we can guarantee the long term preservation of this code. So having just a record in a registry and uh, pointing it pointing to the actual artifacts in software heritage is a possibility and is it is done by aggregators and registries all around so uh that could be um a, a good solution and does anyone else want to say anything quickly on this i can say something uh, very quickly which basically what i wrote i, I think both approaches are fine so no strong opinion for favor in one versus another as moran said based on it's based a little bit on the use case but for example in cycles we have uh, resources that are just registries and only have metadata and point to the uh, whatever the archival resources and we have also uh, repositories where they keep a copy of the deposit the deposited software Great, thank you. Um, we're we're actually officially at time. I want to try to just get one more question in, but I'll certainly understand if people need to, to go and drop off. Um, but I, I do want to do Sarah's question since we mentioned it before, um, which is, uh, what role do you see for publishers enforcing use of code repositories that meet best practices as defined by Psycodes or Code Meta? And what trade-offs do you see between lowering barriers to making code available versus the best ways to make code available? Uh, Christina, you've unmuted, so I assume you want to say something. Yeah, I'll jump in here. So enforcing is a tricky word for publishers. We ask that people share that their either their data or their software in a community accepted and trusted repository, whatever the community decides that community accepted and trusted means to them. Uh, you know, we ask that repositories adhere to uh, repository guidance and, and uh, sort of certification procedures that exist, uh, but we don't 
feel that as a publisher, we have the expertise to enforce repository choice on the publishing staff side. We educate our editors about what uh, community accepted and trusted means for repositories. And we ask, uh, as a scholarly society, we ask our sections to come up with best practices for their disciplines uh, that that sort of hopefully will meet these best practices as defined by disciplinary requirements. Uh, but uh, it's uh, difficult to enforce things like that uh, without uh, domain expertise on your side. Does that, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you. Um, let's, let's, so let's, uh, as long as we're jamming less questions in the overtime, let's do one more um, and do the one from Chris, which is uh, asking about other policy, uh, uh, other policy require other policy requirements um, that funders can take to incentivize software and code sharing uh, rather than sticks. Um, and and maybe I'll just say quickly. I think one thing that I thought was really great was the French Open Science um, Open Source Software Prizes that they are giving out annually now. Uh, and so I think the idea of prizes is one thing that seems to be catching on in a few different countries, although not in the U.S. yet. Um, we also, uh, well, okay, maybe I'll just stop with that one and see uh, who else. Uh, Daniel, you have, you have something you want to add? Yeah, uh, something um, I, I like a lot to, to learn from some example, and uh, I, I like a lot for, uh, how the machine learning community is doing it. And okay, well, now there is a lot of hype about machine learning, so maybe there is a lot of motivation to share stuff, but uh, if you see, they share all their source code. The part of the success, I think, is due to to how the the open source community is sharing stuff. So that is a very good example on how sharing works, and how sharing can actually uh, create a lot of impact for everything that you're doing. So every single paper, or not every single paper, but most papers that are out have an implementation and you can test it out. And then immediately uh, a whole lot of people try to incorporate it into their pipelines. It's a, I think it's a great example on why open science should be followed. And then just going backwards, Christina, and then Moran, and we'll kind of close with that potentially if, if you either of you or both have comments. Yeah, I, I'll quickly say that, you know, in the US, there's a big move right now to integrate data management better into um, into awards uh, from funders as part of uh, the move towards more open science. I think uh, this is a great stick for funders to, to you know, make it part of the awardee process, make it uh, required to share your data and or software after the grant. Um, but alongside that, I think needs to come this conversation with domains about best practices and how to make sure that we're not just sharing openly, but we're also sharing fair data. We're also sharing reproducible software. Okay, Moran? Yes, thank you, Dan. So I agree with you that the award is a, a good way to go. Uh, an, another way is uh, funding the actual resources to make it open because uh, applying all the things, all the policies that we are having um, around and the metadata, um, uh, give, providing metadata or sharing it online takes time, takes resources. So having uh, personnel that is uh, uh, dedicated to this task would be a way to go to have software shared more. Okay, and I'll, and I'll just close by saying that I just put a link into chat about a paper that uh, actually that Aaron, who's here, um, led the, the writing of that was um, actually policy recommendations for funders. Uh, and that includes what Moran just said, and I think it includes prizes, and I think it includes what, what the others have said as well. Um, so we, so a few of us did try to, to write this at some point as a, something funders could take a look at and hopefully act on. Okay, with that, uh, we're five minutes over. So thanks everybody for sticking around. Um, thanks for coming. Thanks for the good questions. Thanks to all the presenters for, for doing the work and putting this together. And uh, hopefully there's another session coming up. Um, thanks again, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.